welcome to Dead Man Talking. Tonight's show, we welcome back a good friend and brother from another mother, Will Ring, from over on Reddit, No Sleep. A personal favourite of mine from over on the Reddit platform, and I'm sure you guys will agree, an exciting author. As ever though, please do let us know what you thought down below in the comments box. Please do like and share. It really does help build the channel and our community further. And why not hashtag Team Fear and DMT's Cryptid Crew. And so, with that aside, let's get into tonight's story. Entitled The Beast of Carter's Lake Part 1 Let's get straight into that. Have you ever been truly scared? Now, I'm not talking about some drunk driver cutting you off in traffic and causing you to slam on the brake and damn near crash into a ditch kind of thing. But that surreal and visceral terror that makes you question what is even real anymore. Sort of fear. That I'm looking into the eyes of the thing that will end my life. Kind of horror. Okay, they may be a little bit on the nose, but you get what I'm saying, right? Well, even as I write this, my fingers are shivering like it's twenty below in my house. It's been a few days, but I'm still processing it, while barely having been able to sleep a damn wink since that night. When I do sleep, just about all I see is those damned eyes, cutting their red and glow through the trees. Or just one of them, peering through my window, just waiting for me. Jill and I met at a party a few months back, and we've spent almost every day together since. The fact that my name is Jack brought our mutual friends a lot of laughs, but it could get annoying at times. My buddy Darren has a cabin out in the woods, out near Carter's Lake, and we were spending a long weekend with him and some other friends. And we did a good bit of hiking over those days, to which we would return to the same jokes practically every damn time. So, uh, did Jack and Jill go up the hill? Darren would ask with a smile. Oh, God damn it, man. Did you both have a buck and a quarter? He squeaked out in between chuckles. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I came down with 250. <laughs> Jill replied with a sigh. And of course, Darren's wife, Sarah, her brother, Dane, and his husband, Blake, all cracked up while I joined my girlfriend in her exhausted sigh. It had been funny at first. What, 20 times or so? But Christ, it was getting old. Still, it had been a fun weekend to that point, even with the endless stream of the same lame punchlines at our expense. The cabin itself was absolutely gorgeous. Two floors, five bedrooms, each with its own bathroom. A wide wraparound deck with a hot tub and the works. Darren came from a wealthy family, but he never shoved it in our faces or anything. I have a basic nine-to-five gig and Jill was a nurse, so, so neither of us had the most comfortable and carefree lifestyle but it was nice to spend some time amongst the far more financially stable. Not to mention, we were able to stay in this beautiful place rent-free. And so membership does have its privileges, I suppose. We have been out there since that Thursday, and so we were only two days into our five-day stint at Le Chateau du Daron, as he liked to call it. As we approached that Saturday night, my buddy handed me one of his numerous credit cards and asked if I'd mind making a liquor store run. He told me he wanted a bottle of Glenlivet, a few cases of Killian's Irish Red, and whatever else Jill and I may want. Well, who was I to refuse? He even tossed me the keys to his Hummer, which I had been dying to take for a spin. Now, the cabin was nestled pretty deep into the woods, and the road that led to and away from it only barely qualified as an actual road. But the thick tires of the Humvee handled it so much better than my little Honda. It took me half a mile or so to get the feel for it, especially with it being at least twice the size of my tiny Civic. But before I knew it, Jill and I were hauling us in the direction of the far better paving of the main road. The sun had already begun its descent for the night, and the liquor store was a good twenty minutes from the highway, thirty or so counting a bumpy gravel road through the woods, and so it would likely be creeping up to ten by the time we got back. I did feel nice to just spend a little time away from the group, and even better to be sharing a company with my lovely girlfriend. I had never met her before that party, but I was sure I didn't have a chance with her until she approached me. Well, back then, she had pink hair down the middle of her back, whereas these days she was rocking a vibrant purple, just down to her shoulders. 
It was the full tattoo sleeve and thick rim glasses that grabbed my attention at first, as those are both features that I find absolutely striking, and she wore them so well. I've always been something of a nerd myself, so either we spend a good couple of hours discussing everything from scary movies to anime, I was already on the brink of head over heels. I'm just a shaggy-haired dork from a small town on the other side of the state, so I could never expect it to have met someone who checked out every single box I look for in a partner. And sure, we had a share of pointless spats over a short time together, but that only made the make-up sessions so much more exciting. I almost wondered if we had those random disagreements with that factor in mind sometimes, but that's... <laughs> that may just be me. As we pulled up to the intersection of the highway, it was probably the first time I noticed the sounds. We had the radio blaring for most of the ride while we got awfully attempted to sing along. But I'd always had a strange habit of turning down the volume at intersections, especially the busier ones. I don't worry, I haven't got some long-winded backstory about some five-ton dump truck I didn't hear because the radio was too loud or anything. It's just something I've always done since I started driving. And whatever the reason, that's when I heard the howling. Though I'm not entirely sure if that's what I'd call it, to be honest. And we've been hearing plenty of wildlife over the previous days and nights, and so I don't know why this one jabbed a fork into my spine, but something about it, I don't know, felt off somehow. I didn't know if there was any wild dogs or wolves in that area, but I'd heard anything from birds chirping to squirrels squeaking around the cabin. Well, it was the occasional barking, but I just assumed that to be some distant neighbor's pet or something. If this wailing, gargled hound had come from a dog, well, it was from a breed I had never seen or heard before. And it sounded to be a veritable beast of one too. Uh, you hear that? Jill asked, looking as alarmed by the noise as I did. Yeah, freaky, right? I replied, attempted a sound on phase. Regardless of the fact, it sounded as though it came from maybe yards from where we'd part waiting for a break in the traffic. A wounded animal, you think? Uh, maybe so. We'll keep an eye out when we come back, yeah? She just nodded before I turned onto the highway, cranking the radio back up to drown out any other potentially unnerving sounds. I still couldn't say why that random wail got me so shaken up. In all honesty, for one reason or another, something about it seemed like it was directed at us. If that even makes the slightest bit of sense. It felt like it was threatening us, in a way like the old haunted house movies with Get Out painted across the walls in thick blood dripping down the drywall. Of course, I may well have been overreacting. My mother always told me I was far too imaginative for my own good, and so I tried to push it to the side for the time being, while continuing on our quest for a trunk load of booze. As predicted, it was getting close to ten by the time we arrived back at the slender open into the gravel road. And, as much as I enjoyed driving Darren's Hummer, I was ready to kick back and just relax. And Gio was shifting in her seat, looking equally as tired of being on the road. I raised my hand to turn the volume down on the radio before deciding not to follow through with my intersection ritual for once. The traffic had quietened down considerably, and so getting back onto the rougher path went much smoother on the return trip, though I could swear I could hear that awful wailing again as soon as the front tyres hit the gravel. I was sure it had just been my head until my girlfriend gave me a sideways glance before wrapping her fingers around my hand and resting on the centre console. We didn't verbalise our concerns this time, though our vehicular karaoke had not resumed since we hit the main road a good 40 minutes before. When Jill screamed out, after we had only been back on the road to the cabin for a few minutes, I down there slammed the Hummer into a tree. Jesus, I yelled, fighting to keep control of the heavy vehicle. Did you see that? Jill asked through the heavy breaths. Uh, see what? Uh, what's wrong? The eyes. Uh, did you see them? Uh, what eyes, babe? Uh, they were right next to us. Uh, bright red eyes, just... just... Her words were cut short when another wailing howl echoed from seemingly right behind us. What the fuck is that? I asked, knowing full well my girlfriend had as few answers to give as I did. We were both freaked out, while I pressed the pedal down with much more intensity than I felt comfortable in both a vehicle I wasn't used to, as well as a road I didn't know too well. 
I suspect we were on the same page. Neither of us knew what the hell was out there, nor did we particularly want answers to that. I had to pull my hand free from her grasp to focus on keeping a heavy and wide SUV from drifting too far to one side or the other. But the next howl that caused me to jump and scream out sounded as though it was only feet from us at most. When something slammed hard into the rear passenger side door, it took everything I had not to wrap the front bumper around the thick trees, while causing me to almost lose control of my bladder at the same time. The next wail was far more aggravated than the last, though I didn't exactly have any basis of comparison for what qualified it to seem that way. The next assault, this time against the door I sat directly beside, forced me to lose my ability to keep the wheels pointed in the right direction, causing us to careen to the right. And though there was only an overgrown field alongside the passenger side door at the time, Jill and I both yelling out as the wheels bounced across the elongated blades of grass, while almost getting lodged in the occasional dip. I still fought to guide us across the less desirable path, hopeful to escape whatever the hell it was that seemed set on tormenting us. And that very battle came to a close, when one final whistle to the left side of the Hummer sent us tumbling across the grass and dirt, ultimately ending with a thickened tree trunk down there crushing the roof down onto us. We were both shaken, not to mention bruised and bloodied. Neither of us seemed to be badly hurt, though. It was just hard to get a full idea of our injuries, hanging by our seatbelts and a half-crushed Humvee. We were trying to make as little noise as possible, while we were to unbuckle ourselves. But I, for one, was certain that whatever knocked us from the road would be unlikely to leave it at that. Everything around us had fallen almost unnervingly quiet, accentuating every single movement we made to break loose from the belts around us. The smell of the varying types of alcohol filled the cab, almost causing me to feel a little nauseous, even if I hadn't ingested a drop. Over the course of the heavy vehicle rolling, most of the bottles practically blew apart, as well as some of the cans. A mixture of beer, vodka and whiskey rained across us, but fortunately the majority of the glass shards didn't make it up front. Jill got herself free before I did, but when I finally had to use my pocket knife to slice food about, I almost fell on top of her, as she was now lying against the door, closest to the ground. I tried to check out her wounds to the best of my ability, but fortunately they didn't look too bad. She had a small gash across her left eyebrow, a few scrapes across her arms and, and a nasty looking cut across her left shoulder, where it appeared some other glass from the shattered window of her door, or perhaps the exploding bottles may have sliced into her. I had a thumping headache, and my right wrist was throbbing, feeling as though it had inflamed a good bit, but I felt fine otherwise, aside from a certain degree of shock setting in. I tried to peer through the windshield to see if I could catch a glimpse of our attacker, but the glass was cracked into spiderwebs and buckled outwards from the roof collapsing in on us. Jill and I both breathing so heavily that I felt like a panted dog myself, which only flashed me back to the haunted house of whatever seemed set of laying us to rest. And when I crawled into the back seat, in an attempt to see if I could make out anything around us, the headlights blinked before snuffing out, and leaving us in practically pitch darkness. I worked my way back up front, extending my leg to push the windshield out. The crackling of the glass and the stretching of the rubberized seal around it provided another series of disturbing sounds against the otherwise silent forest. When the window finally gave way, what was left of it crashed to the ground, causing me to freeze in place while my chest tightened. Jill wrapped her fingers around my arm, causing me to jump from being so on edge at the time that any unexpected sensation was enough to almost make my heart explode. Don't, Jill whispered, whimpering slightly as I reached out to pull myself through the opening I had just made. We have to, babe. We can't just wait here for whatever that thing is. I felt her grip release, allowing my right arm to join the one that now held onto the window bracket. I was terrified. I wouldn't even attempt to convince myself otherwise, but I knew we couldn't just sit there and wait while hoping for the best. I felt the warped and crushed hummer rock and tilt as I worked my way out into the field, next to the tree line we had slammed into. Jill was visibly shivering as I held up my hand to help her out, and she reluctantly reached out, 
before another one of those haunting wails howled out from a direction I couldn't pinpoint. No, I can't, Jill said, with tears pouring down her face, pulling back away from me. You have to. I'm not going to leave you here. No, you go. Get help. Jill, I'm not about to just fucking leave you here. We have to stick together. I'll protect you. You just have... How the fuck can you protect anyone from something like that? She was bordering on hysterical, belting out the words in between moans and whimpers. And to be completely honest, I couldn't deny she had a point. How the hell could I do anything to keep her safe against something that could swat a massive SUV off the road like a fly? I didn't want to leave her behind, but there was no time to debate our situation with some sort of beast toying with us. The whole idea that still felt almost ridiculous to even consider, but it was the only theory that made any sort of rational sense. <sighs> okay, I said, still feeling uneasy about this course of action. You stay here and I'll go get help. She just nodded her head, still trembling all over. Get into the back behind the seats. Stay hidden and keep as quiet as you can, okay? Another nod as she worked her way into the back, not taking her eyes off me. I didn't like this. I didn't like leaving her behind, but it would seem I had little choice in the matter. I looked around while fishing in my pocket for my phone. And to my amazement, it was still functional, though the screen had a few new cracks. You got yours? I asked. She looked stunned for a moment before leaning back towards the front seat and feeling around for her purse. I called halfway back in to help before she finally grabbed onto the strap. And just in front of where she had been sitting, she pulled out her untarnished phone, looking back at me with a strained smile. When anything happens, you call me, okay? She let out a heavy and stuttered sigh. Huh? No service. It fucking figures. She chuckled, but it was about as phony as a laugh could sound. God damn it, I said with what felt like an even more forced and falsified giggle. Just go. I'll be okay here. I'll be back as soon as I can, okay? I'll bring help, one way or another. And she nodded again, before. I love you. Passed through her lips. We still hadn't spoken those words to one another, but I can't deny that they have been lingering in my mind for a while now. And of course, I had most suddenly hoped for a far better situation to reveal these feelings, but it still made a warmth spread through me I hadn't realised was lacking from my extremities at the time. I love you too, I said with a far more enthusiastic smile than I knew myself to be capable of. As she beamed back at me, and that alone lit a fire under me to find a way to get us both through this in one piece. We just looked at each other for a few more moments until she shrank away behind the side of the passenger seat. Oh, you stay hidden, no matter what you hear, if it sounds like hellfire is raining down around you, don't even think about coming out. She didn't speak, only raised her upturned thumb from behind the seat back. Were it not for the circumstances, I would have found it sort of cute, but I needed reassurance on this. Baby, I need you to promise me. Yeah, I hear you. I promise, whispered from the back. My heart was jackhammering as I turned to face whatever lay ahead of me still feeling quite lost amongst the fur and surroundings. Fortunately, my eyes had grown somewhat accustomed to the darkness, and with a crescent moon above lending a hand. I still couldn't figure out why whatever had attacked our vehicle had suddenly taken it upon itself to disappear, but I wasn't about to let my guard down. I gripped the hilt of my pocket knife so tightly that I felt as though I would dig my fingernails into the flesh of my palm. I was sure it would offer little protection against something that could so easily force a heavy SUV from the road. But it was my best and only defence at the time. And I crept onwards, still trying to remain as quiet as possible, which was no easy task with discarded branches and dried out leaves lying on the ground beneath the grass, even in the open field I was crossing to seek out the road that led back to the cabin. I had no way of knowing how far I would have to walk to get back there, but I was sure I was closer to that than the highway we left in the dust. When I was finally able to make out the gravel road, 
the open field led me to another section of dense forest. It was much easier to keep myself concealed behind the trees, but after a good mile and a half of hiking, I walked out into another wide open area. I had been steadily growing more confident that I may actually survive this, when yet another wailing howl echoed across the darkened trees to the left of the road. And it was close, far closer than I think I even realized at the time. And though my breathing had begun to settle down over the last handful of yards, I was now on the brink of hyperventilation, frozen in place, erratically cutting my eyes across the trees. It was around that time that I came face to face with a far more visceral and heart-stopping fear than I had ever imagined possible. It took me a second to realize that the glowing red lights shining from behind the trees were the illumination of two eyes peering back into mine. I heard a gnarled growling sound that came from just below where the twin glowing eyes softly lifted and lowered, as though whatever they belonged to was panting with heavy breath. I could feel the blood draining from my face while the nausea of gazing into mortality churned in my stomach. And as the rough growl grew more aggravated, the eye sunk lower, giving me the image of something preparing to pounce. Ah, oh, this is it. I thought this would be where I meet my end. When it happened so quickly that my mind could barely grasp what I was seeing. The rumbling and gargled sound blended with the snapping and shattering of branches and bark. And when the behemoth burst from the trees right at me, I screamed out, feeling as though the throbbing veins in my temples were about to erupt, squirting a healthy stream of blood to each side. I brandished my small pocket knife as though I was wielding Excalibur itself, when in reality I had a fucking three-inch blade trained on what looked to be about ten feet of darkened fur and muscle speeding right at me. I felt my body soaring backwards through the air after a giant hand swatted me across the chest. I knew something was broken when I made contact with the ground, but I was in so much shock I had no way to know what had snapped, only that it hurt like a son of a bitch. I raised my dizzy head to see the thing charging right at me on all fours. It looked like an enormous wolf, though its eyes still shone that eerie glow, illuminating the elongated wrinkled snout while thick drool slobbered from its gaping maw. I had no time to get back to my feet, and so I rolled forward, swinging my pitiful little blade through the air before me, just in time to make contact with something. I don't know where on the beast I hit, but it let out an ear-piercing squeal that almost caused me to reach across the grass I'd perched on. And before I had a chance to react, the thing leaped from behind me, disappearing back into the trees. I looked down at my trembling hand to see thick, dark blood dripping from the short blade, along with a chunk of black fur wedged into the hinge of the folding mechanism. Run, you dumb bastard! The voice in the back of my mind yelled out at me, though I still knelt in place with my mind reeling. Fucking move! I lifted myself, feeling no strength from the legs that twitched and shivered, before I convinced them to start running. My chest was burning, but I had no time to investigate how strongly the blood was flowing from the gashes left in the wake of the claws that cut through my shirt and skin. My everything hurt from my back to my legs, along with what I assumed to be a broken rib or four, as they stabbed into my insides as I forced myself forwards. And as my side split, I almost allowed myself to slow down, until another anguished and angered howl bellowed out from behind me, convincing me to push through the pain that almost caused me to break. Now, the agony had almost grown impossible to tolerate, but I wouldn't let up. Not only had I royally pissed the thing off, but I still had to find a way to get back to Jill, who I prayed to God was still alive. Maybe twenty or thirty feet ahead, I saw a familiar ridge, which, if memory serves, was right at the edge of my friend's property. My painful sprint had slowed considerably, especially since I was now running uphill, hopefully towards salvation. I reached the top of the ridge, where the ground leveled back up again, to sure enough see the lights from Le Chateau du Darren, just ahead in the distance. My lungs were practically begging for me to allow them to relax for even a second, but when I heard that growling, panting wheeze coming from behind me, 
accompanied by four heavy feet beating against the surface of the ground. I had to force them to work much harder than I had up until this point. I screamed out through my straining breath, pleading with as much effort as I could for my friends to hear me, as I forced one foot in front of the other. There are no words to truly describe either the amount of pain I was in, or the true and horrifying fear that I was experiencing, as I heard those weighted paws trample the earth beneath them. I just kept yelling out and practically squilling the words, Help me! over and over, until I finally saw the door open ahead of me. Ah, who the hell's out there? Darren's voice called out. It's Jack! God damn it! Help me! Jesus Christ! I heard call out as I neared the cabin, and with my feral pursuer sounding closer to me by the second. I was so close, but I just knew I would be torn to ribbons by the time I reached the open door. I could feel the foul breath and sticky saliva spritzing across the back of my neck, while the jagged bones still worked and ripping through my insides. When I heard the panting only inches from my ear, a gunshot rang out through the night, before a second caused another shrieking squeal to wail out from almost right beside me. Just before I fell onto the wooden steps of my friend's front deck, I heard those scampering feet quietening more and more as they sped away. Back in the direction I had fled from. And I stared up at my friends, who had all gathered up on the patio, feeling a sense of indescribable gratitude before everything went black. Wow, 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 wow. Certainly another one. Wow. Chest pounding, absolutely nerve wracking. I don't know about you guys, but that had me on the edge of my seat. That's part one of three in this incredible series by our good friend, Will Rain. A mighty thank you to you, Will, for allowing me to narrate this story on the show. Really such an intense storyline with lots of suspense and impending doom. And I really can't wait to get into the next part. Well, guys and girls as ever, you know the drill. Please do let us know what you thought down below in the comments box. Please do like and share. It really does help build the channel and our community further. And why not hashtag Team Fear and DMT's Cryptid Crew. Now if you think you can pen a story that packs as much bite as that, then please do get in touch with me at the contact email, which is as on screen. Contact the dead one at gmail.com. I really look forward to hearing from you. I hope everybody's had a fantastic week at work and are looking forward to a relaxing weekend with good food and even better company. But above all, guys, remember be safe, not sorry. that very battle came to a close when one final was sought to the left the la -la -la -la. I just had a shaggy head dog from a small town on the other side a will rain from over on reddit no sleep no sleep tonight's tonight's Jill and I both breathing so heavily that I felt like a panting dog myself which only flashed me back to the hall. Fucking hell. Jill. 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 Jill.